Uh, today we're here with Carly McConkie, and she's the author of the book, The Cult Effect, uh, a gripping account of the brutal impact of a spiritual and violent extremist movement. Uh, so welcome. Thank you so much, Pat. Lovely to be here. Yeah, it's, it's good to have you with us. I, I was really wondering if you could tell us uh, how, about this group and how you found it. Sure. Um, when I was 21 and I just finished university, uh, I was a few months out and I went to the Mind Body Spirit Festival in Sydney okay. and okay. I just wanted to have a psychic reading. I wasn't sure about, you know, if I wanted to continue with uh, public relations, which I'd done at university. Um, I just moved back from um, being in the country at uni. So I was back with my parents, very unsure about my future. And so I went to have this psychic reading and the actual psychic reader was a part of this cult. And uh, she showed me the stand where the um, organization, it was portrayed as a personal development company um, that if I did this one course, it would, you know, change my life. I'd be able to, um, you know, be healthier, um, reach my potential, all of those amazing things. Uh, and I saw on the stand that all of the people on there were very happy and, um, you know, exuberant and really believed in what they were doing. So I signed up straight away. Um, yeah, so that's how I found them and did the course, the first course within about um, three months of that huh. day. And, and what were the, the nature of the course? Was it a seminar? Or, um, how was it organized? Sure. So it was um, kind of a new age personal development program and there, it was five nights and the whole weekend. Okay. So um, we weren't really told too much about it at the beginning, um, but um, you know, the processes as such. So when we went, um, you know, on the first night we signed our indemnity, this, that, and the other, and it was all, you know, we don't talk about the processes, but you just see, you know, how you feel at the end, that type of thing. And the whole process were things like, um, meditation chanting and um, emotional release so they called it accessing so sort of hitting mats and um, pillows and things and so there was a lot of it was quite frightening actually um, you know everyone just either screaming or crying and things like that it was um, and you know they had rebirthing and all those types of things so wow. it was quite traumatic the whole um, program that's, uh, that's interesting hitting the things there's a uh, a kind of therapy called bioenergetics where people take a uh, like a, a badminton and start hitting a pillow um, to release but exactly. that for, the format of the you know, number of days in the weekend is very typical of large group awareness trainings um, yeah no that's exactly what it was when we um went further so at the end of that program, you know, before the program, we were kind of told that's the only program you need to do, you know, you'll have all the tools you need. And then at the end of the program, um, you know, we were told of these 17 other courses that will help us reach our enlightenment, you know, that type of thing. And then as you progress, I, you know, went on another course, that was July, went on another course in um, the September, then another course in the October. And then just, you know, for the next um, sort of eight or so years, just continued on these courses. Um, but yeah, as you progressed in the more developed courses, we did have, um, baseball bats and we were hitting sort of boxing, um, big, you know, pads and things. So it was all about that emotional release. And the premise was that you would be cleansing your cellular memory, your genes from this lifetime, your ancestors, and also your past lives. Yeah. So it, it, a little bit of the reincarnation entered into it. Yeah. And, and yeah. how was the leader uh, portrayed? How did you think about her? Um, yeah, so, she yeah, she was, what, what's that, sorry? Was she like an avatar, a, a, a returned god person? Yeah, what was so, unique about her? Yeah, so obviously when um, I first met her on the first program, it was called The Next Evolutionary Step. Um, and she was very, very charismatic, you know, stood at the front of the room. She was very, she was very petite, you know, five foot, nothing and um very energetic um you know slim all those types of things lots of energy very articulate um it felt like she could read you and um was psychic knew what you were you know thinking um you know with the programs uh you actually were told that you would um increase your psychic ability and actually um you know improve that etc so yeah, very charismatic. Um, later on in the more developed programs, uh, there was a year-long program that we did called Personal Mastery and Metaphysical Counseling. 
you know, we wanted to become counsellors and help people and heal people. And on that particular program, she uh, basically intimated that she was the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. And along the way, there was also um, a, a large theme of Atlantis. And um, we perceived her as the Queen of Atlantis back in those times. Um, you know, later on, we did a program called The Initiates. And, um, you know, that was supposed to um, help you achieve your highest enlightenment. And she basically told us she was um, one of the six or seven or 12 on the Intergalactic Federation. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, all of these things came through, um, all about past lives, um, esoteric, you know, all those types of things. So, yeah. So it was a very new age, new age type of group. It sounds like it had its roots in sort of theosophy, uh, of the teachings of Madame Blavatsky, possibly. Yeah. So I think um, the first course she did, um, the next evolutionary step, apparently was based on the turning point, um, which... Um, I just can't think of the, the guy's name who, who did that, but um, Walter Bellum. Okay. Yeah. So a lot of that sort of emotional release and things. Um, she claims that, you know, that was um, partly based on her, on that. But yeah, I personally came from a, a Catholic upbringing as well and was, um, you know, very devout Catholic up until I was about 19. And then I went to university um, out at Bathurst, a, a country town near Sydney and went to the church there and the, the priest there was talking about sin and hell and things like that. And it was very different to my little community church back in um, Sydney. So I definitely turned away from the Catholic church at that point and wanted to find something else. So before I did the course, I was reading a lot of spiritual sort of esoteric new age books. And I've since read that in the, so when I first did that course, it was 1996. And I read that the new age sort of movement and personal development in the mid nineties was at its peak. So, um, you know, this program and this um, woman had been very successful um, getting, you know, the first program, there was about 100 people on it and subsequent programs, 80 to 100. So she'd been quite successful in um, sort of recruiting a lot of people along the way. But what, what, what kept you there? What was the things that uh, you found exciting and interesting in the teachings? Sure. I think um, the ex experiences I had with um, the processes, you know, um, and we were on a sort of vegetarian or vegan diet and lots of sort of exercise and meditation and sort of spiritual awakening experiences. And obviously being in a group as well, I think um, I've been, I was quite a shy person when I was young and, you know, probably still am a little bit introverted. And just, I guess I was looking for that belonging and that group um, sort of feeling where you know, I knew that I could just be myself and that I was accepted. Um, you know, I'm sure not everyone probably liked me or or all that type of thing, but I kind of felt like, um, you know, pe the group had to be unconditional because that was our kind of new family. Oh. Yeah. So, I mean, progressively it got a lot worse and um, the, the cult leader, you know, became known as a cult leader. And you know, she would try and convince us that she wasn't and, um, you know, but trying to always defend the group that we were in and her to the public. Uh, she, she was on a current affair in 1998, one of our Australian current affair programs um, as being a cult leader. And she'd uh, basically conned a lot of money out of a lot of people. So, you know, it pretty much from the time I was in, um, well, from 1998, it did start going downhill and got a lot worse. And as a lot of people left, there was more pressure on us within the inner circle as such. Uh, from about 19, the end of 99, I actually started working for um, this woman and, um, you know, it wasn't paid, of course, and ended up working for the next 10 years, both for her businesses and her personally. Oh. So, yeah, things did what, get... What, what, what uh, sort of was the chink in the armour that got you to... Um, maybe make a decision to reevaluate your involvement or to have that involvement sort of slack off? Sure. I think after, it was about 13 and a half years when I escaped as such. And um, I say escape because towards the end, there was, um, the whole time there was sort of psychological abuse, the verbal abuse and, you know, um, putting me down and others around me. Um, I had three children by that point and um, my ex-husband had left and you know a few times and I think it was just getting so desperate she had actually become a psychologist by that point 
So she'd be doing a lot of study. I'd been, you know, typing out all her lectures and tutorials and things and typing her assignments and it was always full on. And um, at that time, she'd actually been investigated by our um, uh, health regulator, um, APRA it's called, um, because of all the complaints against her. And I think that there was heightened pressure on her. And so she became quite worse. And she, you know, basically physically assaulted me again, you know, twice over two days to um, a really bad point where I just felt like um, I couldn't go through this again. She'd done it previously years before. And um, I think the financial pressure as well. Uh, by that point, I was handing over, you know, 500 a week to her. I was renting her one of her homes um, every week and just, um, you know, had three kids that, that were in um, daycare and school and vacation care, trying to maintain a, you know, 65-acre um, property of hers, um, working on the property during the day, working in the office during the night. I was sleeping only two hours a night, that type of thing. Um, all of these sort of, um, you know, mind control techniques that we know about, um, just to try and keep me going and keep me there. But, um, you know, I think it was a number of things, but the financial pressure after she, after I was handing over all this money, I, I logically, you know, no, noted down all of my um, bills and things. And I'd have $50 left a week for food and taking care of my children. And I just thought, look, I literally can't do this anymore. You know, feeling the um, results of the physical um, assaults and things um, inside of me, I think my spirit had broken. And I think uh, we also, our cult leader um, prophesized Armageddon type thing, survival, and that, um, you know, for the 11th of November, 2011, then it turned into 12th of December, 2012, et cetera. And so that was the beginning of 2010. And I thought to myself, I'd rather escape and die in two years time and enjoy my children for two years instead of working my guts out for this woman. Um, and, you know, bring up a very uh, a valid point that I have heard from many former members. And one of the things that I try to communicate to families is being in a group is not necessarily easy. Uh, no, and, and, mm -hmm. and people leave because it becomes just too difficult to, exactly. to do and sort of all the things that you rationalize along the way you just they collapse sort of that shelf of rationalization just collapses and you just can't do it anymore and i know that for exactly. myself and other people that have been in groups thought we had the thought that well maybe i'll go to hell but I'd rather just have a couple of uh, nights of good sleep or exactly. I want to have I go out and do what I want to do one day. I don't want to exactly. have to be doing this. And so exactly. it's it just worth it. And that's the, the thing that I think happens to a lot of people. Yeah. What, one of the things I was uh, you know, interested in, in talking about your book a little bit is what inspired you to write the book? Mm. So, um, when I first um, got out with my three children, I, I was so lucky. Um, it was perfect timing because I got out in the January and then in the March, we actually had a KIFS or Cold Education and Family Support Conference at Brisbane Parliament House in Australia. We actually did have some um, psychologists um, come out from the US. So um, Johnny Whitsett and um, yeah, a few others. And that was amazing just to be able to have that education right off the bat, um, go through the, you know, um, what actually did happen, um, why I got involved, know that it wasn't my fault, those types of things. And I think I really had an advantage over even um, a lot of the other members of my group that came out after me. And I met a journalist there um, called Michael Bachelard and um, he actually gave a speech there and he um, asked if, you know, he could do a story on me, et cetera, at some point. So I went back and I wrote, um, you know, about 86 pages of everything that happened. I just did it over about four days, just purging everything out. And then, so, you know, subsequently we had some articles come out and things like that, but um, I ended, actually ended up in a court case um, because our cult leader did sue the journalists, um, the media companies and myself and my ex-husband. But so that went for three years and then we ended up winning that court case. She settled on the first night of the first day of the trial, but she has, it, despite, um, you know, numerous and numerous complaints against her about being a psychologist and telling the truth about this woman, 
Um, she is actually still registered as a psychologist in Australia. And, you know, um, in about 2016, I ended up, um, my boss was made redundant and uh, I ended up leaving my job and I decided, okay, now I'm going to write this book. And a few months later, I mean, sorry, the next year, I ended up seeing that um, this woman was going to be um, studying in the UK. She was already doing a PhD in Melbourne. She was studying to become a doctor of psychology over at the University of Leicester. I saw it online. And I thought to myself, there's no way I'm going to allow that to happen. And I just, um, you know, it took me about a year and a half or more working full time and writing the book. But I just sped up the whole process, you know, every night, every weekend I was at the cafe writing my book to try and get my book published in time. So it was published at the end of July and I sent it over to the University of Leicester, um, you know, so that they know who this woman was. And I wanted the truth out there basically. Um, you know, she'd, she'd also um, created these workshops called Resolving Vilification. So she was lying to the world saying that everything that her, um, you know, ex-members and ex-students had been saying about her was false um, when it was actually true. And I just, you know, inside me, I've always been an honest person and fighting for the truth. And I just wanted to get the whole truth out there. And I thought, writing my book would help that um you know she ended up not going through with that um doctor's college degree um and you know i feel good about that but i think it's just about you know these cult leaders get away with so much and yeah. i wanted to um put my story out there the good and the bad yeah. um to ensure that the world had the truth about this woman and so who's the who do you want uh, would like to read your book who is the audience that is it people that are interested in this group or do you think it has uh, applicability to a larger audience? Yeah, I think um, I wrote it um, for, I wrote it in a, a way that um, kind of takes the reader through what I went through for those 13 years um, so that families who might have a member inside can actually, you know, have a grasp of understanding about why we stay or why we get involved and then the second part of the book is the recovery so what i went through after that so that families and loved ones can gain an understanding of what their um, loved one is going to go through afterwards it's not going to be easy it might be even more difficult than what they went through in the cult who knows but um you know it's definitely the recovery yeah you bring up a, a very interesting point because i often tell families that it's relatively easy to help someone reevaluate their involvement in a group but for some people, the recovery is much more difficult. Mm. Uh, reintegrating society, not for everybody, but for some people. So that you yeah. have both parts in the book, I think is a, a very important thing. Um, is there something that you learned your, about yourself in writing the book? Oh, I think for anyone who's had any traumatic experience, um, whether it be good or, you know, good, bad or, um, you know, life-changing it it really really helped me therapeutically so much the court case i went through um sifting through all of the evidence as well as writing a book just really helped me get to a stage where now i feel like a normal person and you your logic and your brain can start sort of departmentalizing everything that happened to you and logically seeing um you know the whole process that you went through and it just and to be honest, I've, as I've read and we might, might know that living through trauma again is possibly the only way you can move through it. And writing the book, you know, obviously was very emotional, um, but it helped me to get to a place where I feel sort of normal and more healed. So, um, yeah, it was a, a fantastic process. And, and what do you think um, uh, you'd like to have as a sort of a takeaway about the book? Uh, what would you like people to uh, receive if they read it? Um, just basically to gain that um, sort of understanding of what cult members go through and realize that it isn't their fault that they were manipulated and recruited and that they are going to need that support on the outside. Um, you know, I have a family member who didn't talk to me for three years when I got out and that was highly traumatizing on top of everything else and I'm, I'm not talking to them now. And, um, you know, I think that it's important to not blame 
um, a cult member for what's happened because it is definitely, um, you know, it's the cult leader's fault. And um, they got into that situation because they were a vulnerable person at that time and because they did want to help the world, the planet, whatever their good intentions were. And I think people have to look past the experience to the actual person. And I think, as we might all know, you know, cult members come out and they start talking about their experience to a lot of people, you know, friends and things like that. Like I, I did that and people can't handle it and um, it's too much for them. And, you know, I don't talk to those old school friends anymore because it, it was just too full on for them. And I think um, ex cult members, you know, they need to um, probably, you know, um, go to the, go to a psychologist or a counsellor to possibly help them move through that and rely on their close family members. But on the other hand, the people around them, um, you know, need to have a bit of compassion for what they've been through. And um, yeah, hopefully this book helps them understand. I think that's very, I mean, these are very important things. Uh, uh, because being in a group for some people is like falling in love with an idea. And I think that most people who have not been in a group have maybe been in a relationship where they fell in love mm. with somebody and falling in love is not necessarily rational. You fall mm. in love with an idea, a person, a concept of teaching, you can fall in mm. love. And, uh, and when you're in love, eh, different things are running the show. It's not always your intellect. And I think that most people have made bad decisions about mm. all kinds of things. People invest in a stock because a friend told them to do it, but they didn't, they didn't check it out. They might buy a property because a friend said, oh, this is a great place to live, but maybe they didn't check out all the details of it. We, all, we I think as human beings, we trust people. So we're sort of wired. And mm. sometimes that trust can be taken advantage of by somebody who has a different agenda than others. But I don't, I, when I, I talk to families and I, talk to former members, I tried to get them to come up with a new narrative, a way of explaining what happened to them in a way that other people can hear it. Um, and I know my, I've got friends where I live, I live in Philadelphia, that say, oh, Pat, I cannot believe you would ever belong with a group, in a group. I'm going, well, mm -hmm. you know, that's when I was 17, exactly. <laughs> 24, 25. You're 50, yeah. and you believe in psychics and <laughs> astrologers and all kinds of things um, yeah. i've left that behind so i a lot of people have very irrational beliefs and they yeah. just don't recognize them as as rational or not rational i was wondering if it's possible if maybe you could show your book again yeah. I mean, when, uh, when we play this over we could put up some graphics of it and then um maybe read for, for a couple minutes and give yeah, sure. people a little flavor of the book yeah so sure we could show it to us Thank you. Well, um, I thought I'd choose um, a part that is actually um, almost quoting what our cult leader said at the time, because um, what happened was uh, one of the ex-members had some minutes of a meeting that was on a computer and sent it through to my father. And so a lot of this is actually quoting what the cult leader was saying on a particular night, uh, that year long course I was talking about called Personal Mastery. Um, this was one of those nights and people always took minutes and things like that. So I'll just read that. <laughs> All right. One Saturday night at a combined personal mastery meeting in the center, I was feeling particularly vulnerable and deflated. I had been babysitting everyone's kids that day as I was heavily pregnant and had been allocated to do so. As we all sat around in a circle, Alice started the issue session by stating, I have an issue with the way the kids were handled today. There was a scatteredness all through it. All the kids were fucked up and their sleeping habits were um, due to their bedtimes. It's a reflection of what Sebastian's life, life is like. No regular routine or bedtime. It completely throws them out for the day. Natasha replied, your expectations are completely unrealistic. You're idiotic to put Carly in a position of control with other people's lives. If you think Carly is competent enough to look after someone's future, you're mad. We're still cleaning up the mess in the office. It's been years now. I don't understand why you would. Natasha turned to me. God knows the level of damage you and Michael have done to Sebastian. Then back to Alice. You don't let some fucking idiot experiment with them. I want an explanation, Alice asked me, why you weren't doing their proper sleep times when you knew. I defended myself. I asked Heather if I should put down Patrick the same time as Helen. I was trying to get them all down at the same time. 
This afternoon, you weren't anywhere in to be seen and all the babies were crying, Heather shot back at, uh, accusingly. For what reason, Natasha asked. Give the kids, you've got the best you can offer them. They're LIP kids, what are you doing? You don't stick to a routine with Seb, Dominic interjected. Some nights he's been up so late I'm stunned. You're feeding him at 11 p.m. Natasha pointed to my stomach. You and Michael chose to have another child. Well, I think it was a stupid decision. I began to cry. Why am I so fucked up? Why do I have to be this way? I'm fucking useless. Everyone started laughing. It's not funny. I know I'm fucking up, Seb. She's daddy's little girl, said Natasha, before zeroing in on me again. This high-pitched whining irritates me. Don't dump on me. I have good reason to be annoyed. You can't just reverse out and leave this place. I don't understand what you're carrying on about, she continued. You chose a second child and I believe your reason is because you want to stay at home and not work. It has nothing to do with expanding the family. It's an excuse not to work. These are all the wrong reasons for a second child. Especially when you know you're doing a fucked up job with Sebastian, Alice added. Why would you have another child? I did want to have another child, so Seb, Seb would have a sibling, I argued. That's what I believe. I know what you're saying about the work thing. I did eventually want to work from home, doing healings or working on the computer or something. It's about realising who and what you are, said Natasha. Until then, you can't make a shift. It's so basic. I'm getting really frustrated. She took a deep breath and sighed. Can we get real here? You're nearly nine months pregnant, fat and overweight. The baby will pop out quickly. You'll have two kids. Michael will sleep in the car and you'll be financially destitute. Your cars are fucked. And if you don't work, they'll break down and you'll have to hitch a ride with a child on one hip and the other in your hand. Face it, Carly, this is your lot. Think about contraception very deeply. What are you doing? Of course, while your head isn't functioning, you'll be an idiot. Dead brain equals idiotic re um, actions. Functioning brain equals intelligent actions. If I remember correctly, I said, no matter what, don't lose that cinema job. Are you and Michael planning to keep working after you've finished up this financial stuff? Being realistic, I said, I was going to apply for the full-time job um, that came up at work. We had an older lady we paid $25 a day to look after Sebastian last year. We might be able to find someone similar who's willing to look after them both. Natasha changed tact. It's not Michael's fault you have a, made a mess of your relationship. Work out what you're doing, uh, going to do about fixing it. I don't agree with Michael's behaviour, leaving you this pregnant with Seb. And when you need things, he doesn't come and help you. I can imagine your devastation when that happens. I buried my face in my hands. I'm all alone because he doesn't care. Then thinking the guys, that you guys don't care. You've burned bridges with both parents and all creditors, Natasha concluded. You have to look at what you're doing. You and Michael are both very capable of working your butts off and pay all your bills by the end of the year and have a home deposit. You're both in ingenuous when it comes to getting work. There is no reason to go without. From the previous 30 minutes myriad of issues, I sat with a, a melting pot of emotions and my brain scrambled as I often did during these sessions. I focused on the last positive note left by Natasha. Once more, I knew there was hope of a brighter future with Michael and our children as long as both can, we both continue to work our butts off. Wow, that's so powerful. And, and it tells a story that uh, I think that is universal to people who have been in abusive situations where you're the, the fault and all good comes from the group. And when the group isn't delivering, it's your fault. And yeah. uh, it's just not a pleasant place to be in. And it's that type of experience that helps people reevaluate and move on. And it's a, you went through a, an amazing experience and you've come out on the other side and that's so uh, inspiring. Thanks, I really Pat. appreciate it. I really appreciate it. I think that uh, one of the things we want to tell people about is their, your, your website called Education and Recovery. Um, we'll put the, uh, the URL on, yep. on, on the video, um, but maybe you could tell us what it is. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, my website, um, you know, it's just something that I've done myself to, and I wanted to have that cold education and recovery aspect yep. because um, like we explained before, um, it's just telling people about my book. I've done um, a great podcast on a, sorry, a great, the podcast is great. It's called uh, Let's Talk About Sex, yep. S-E-C-T-S, yes, yep. um, by Sarah. Um, and it's, yeah, that's on there. And 
I also did a page on lobbying to government and, you know, when we um, went to Parliament House a few times over the years, really lob lobbying to government is so important, you know, just to get that change um, to um, help with, you know, making psychological abuse a criminal defence, things like that. Um, so I've got all of the politicians details on there. I've also got a page on Stephen Munch, who we were discussing earlier, um, who has done a lot of speeches and a lot of um, reports for, for ICSA actually. Um, just, yeah, um, what else? Just sort of news and cult news and things like that. So I, I, I took a look at it and it, it was a great resource. And I think that um, your book and the writings and your, your storytelling will be very helpful for the uh, for families and people who are in groups and people who are deciding to leave groups. So I thank you for doing that. Could you hold your book up one more time? Yeah, sure. so, so there we go. Thank you for your time tonight. No, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Thanks, Pat. Hello everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, I am currently unmuting you, Carly. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully you're able to unmute yourself now. There you are. Hi, Carly. Hello. Good. Hi. How are you? <laughs> Good. Thank you for being here. And I'm going to turn down my volume so hopefully that's less echoey for y'all. I, I think it's the middle of the night for you, Carly. Yes, it's about 2 a.m. here. Right. So, my goodness, Carly. That's okay. Oh, yeah. My goodness. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. Well, so, you, if I've got a few lines, that's no, why. No, it's you look fabulous. I, <laughs> look, I look that good at two in the morning. My goodness. I never would have guessed. Thank you for being here. I mean, no, two in the morning, that's true commitment. Well, we have about half an hour. And then I will let you go to bed. <laughs> yes, I um, to. half an hour for questions. So at this time, please submit your questions for Carly. You can also ask Pat questions since he's on today. This is sort of a one of those bonus interviews, is what I call it. So Joe Zimhart did the first 10 interviews in the Meet the Author series. And this is the a little bit of a bonus interview. It's an interview that Pat did with Carly. And it was really cool. I don't know about um, the listeners out there, but I, I thought it was really cool how differently Pat approached the interview compared to Joe. I felt like it, it was a really fun, different take on an author interview compared to what we've been seeing. Um, Joe and Pat have been excellent interviewers throughout this series. Um, both have been excellent and very unique. Um, Joe, for example, is constantly making animal um, references and puns, and he's an artist, so a lot of his, um, his narratives and the way that he explains these sorts of cult dynamics, he always sneaks in animal um, comparisons, which really sticks with the audience, I've found, um, and he's done just a really great job of that. Yeah, Joe's, so. Joe's a great guy, and uh, yeah. uh, both of us spent a Joe. Zimhart and I spent a lot of time in Australia in the 90s doing interventions. It's so kind of an interesting story. I, I just, since we talked, um, I was fascinated by the group and I started doing some research on it and I came across this very odd thing. So I live in downtown Philadelphia and two blocks from my house is a ballet school called the Rock School. And so people from all over the world come to this rock school mm -hmm. uh, to study ballet. And you know, I mean, it's just, it's just a building that's there. But I was reading these articles about your group, and it turns out that your leader's son uh, was at Juilliard, and he, took a, uh, he got a scholarship to come to the rock school. And Natasha came to be at the rock school um, to be like a, ma a den mother, a floor taker, take care of these kids. And she ended up suing the school. She did, yeah. Uh, for wow. kinds of things that, interestingly enough, happened to you. Oh, so, it, it was amazing. Exactly what she was complaining about in her defamation case. 
being yeah. a victim of all those things was exactly what she did as a perpetrator to all of us. It was <laughs> incredible. Wow. It, it was, I was I'm just to read a little bit. She said, they say, uh, I think this is from uh, the Philadelphia Inquirer, I think, um, that she claims that the program was willfully, this is about this rock school program, understaffed and horribly disorganized. It forced her to work seven days a week, up to 20 hours a day. That must have been easy for you, only 20 hours a day. She also asserted that her son had to skip with the dance classes to help her do her work. Her relationship with the rock school management became strained. Uh, and then things got wor- weird. Uh, according to the lawsuit, the defendants, which was the school, uh, and their leaders, um, and staff also, so they said, put an all-out smear cam campaign uh, about her and her history and republishing lies. And it kind of seems to be like a repeat of exactly what happened to you. Exactly. The kind of abuse. Like and, yeah, well, we, yeah, in, in some ways. it's. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it, the article is interesting, and I think it's on your website, and I might, uh, you might want to have people go to your website and read it because it's very fascinating how you go through an experience, you describe your experience, and here your leader comes to my town. Mm. Oh, <laughs> exactly. I like the feeling of being <laughs> abused and forced to work 20 hours a day, and she files a lawsuit which the courts dismissed. Um, I don't know. I think I, I just found it when I was re- preparing for today. Last night, I'm like, I can't believe this. Exactly. Uh, so I, it, it brought the question one thing, and then I'll stop talking, is her psychic abilities. Because mm-hmm. if someone is psychic, she should have known <laughs> ahead of time <laughs> that she was going to be coming to an abusive environment, a rock school, which is not, uh, mm-hmm. that she would be forced to work 20 hours a day. Her son wouldn't be able to take lessons. Her psychic abilities seem to be slightly lacking. Exactly. I just, I mean, we don't know how much of it is true or, you know, what she's made up. And um, it was interesting because we found that online just before my, our own trial was coming up. So, um, yeah, it was just, it's just unbelievable how she goes about, you know, suing for defamation when everything is true. Um, You know, I'm currently in a defamation court case for the second time with her because of my book. So the court case has been going on um, for over two years now. We've only just, um, you know, swapped evidence, this type of thing. It's been very protracted and prolonged. And, you know, I'm I'm having to deal with that um, for the second time. I genuinely thought that she wouldn't sue me again after she'd lost the first one and settled. But other people around me and from my cult um, said, of course, she's going to sue you because that's what she does. And it's just extraordinary that, um, you know, she will keep doing this. I just, um, yeah, I mean, I'm 100% certain that I'll win and hopefully within the next 12 or so months. But, you know, this is what people have to go through with these I, I think I think it would be fascinating. I, I mean, it, my curiosity is like through the roof here. I, yeah. I was my next door neighbor's an attorney. I was going to see if we could get the court records from this mm. lawsuit because That'd I be think good. it would be very interesting because at least what was reported in the paper is so close to what she did to you and she didn't like it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yes. It is fascinating. Yeah. So, so your, your story is compelling. Yeah. That is fascinating. That the same thing. I just, I find that really fascinating. So thank you, Pat, yeah. for doing some research yeah. on that because yeah. I think, I think it really adds some depth to this. So we have some questions coming in if you're ready, Carly. Absolutely. <laughs> Perfect. Yes. Um, somebody said, I loved Patrick's comparison to being in love as a way to explain the cultic mindset. Thanks for that nugget. I also loved, that was one of the things that I kind of remembered from this interview was sort of that comparison. Is there anything mm-hmm. else you two would want to touch on regarding that? I definitely agree that um, it was in a way like I loved everything about her and um you know, those rose-colored glasses that we have and we're so, 
brainwashed and mind controlled, et cetera, that we don't see what's actually happening. And I think that's the thing that's so hard to explain to people who haven't been in a cult, how we can get into that situation, why we stayed so long. Um, it's, it's, and it's hard to explain, um, but you know, that's what I tried to do with my book to take people through that process so that, you know, they could just sort of take that journey with me um, to realize that, um, you know, I'd lost myself and I was totally just enamored with her and that's what kept me there. Yeah. And a lot of the guys that um, were in the group, you know, they all definitely were in love with her and, um, you know, she actually manipulated a lot of them and had relationships with a lot of them, um, you know, and there's still, I believe, a couple still involved. There's a few people that are, that because of my court case, she's sort of sucked them back in. It's very sad that, you know, they were sort of um, out and living their own lives, but because she needs witnesses for my court case, she's brought them back in. Um, and, you know, she's been dangling carrots in front of one particular guy that's still there, um, you know. So it's, yeah, it's definitely what Pat explained. But, you know, the, the idea of falling in love is, is, you know, an analogy because I try to explain to people what it was like. Because when you fall in love, it's, it is not irrational, uh, mm -hmm. generally. I mean, there are people who do set out with a, a, a very specific plan, but generally these are emotional connections. And you can become in love with a person or an idea, a concept. Mm -hmm. um, in our previous series for the Pacific Rim Conference, you've all, uh, what's his last name? Leor. Leor. Yeah. Um, did a great session on awe, the experience mm -hmm. of awe. And I had, we'd spoken in uh, Brussels a few years ago <laughs> about this concept of falling in love. And he refined it a little bit, and he thought that that maybe in, in a neurophysiological way, it would be more like falling in love with a child that you adopted. Um, that you have a, a, a slightly different kind of love or a slightly different kind of connection. So I think that we'll have to ask you all to explore a little bit more from the neurophysiological point of view, that experience. But I think that for many people, it, it, it's like that. I yeah. did have a question about, she's a therapist that's licensed in Australia. Mm -hmm. And was she a licensed therapist when you saw her? No, no. So she was absolutely not um, licensed um, or qualified. And I mean, obviously we were so naive that we didn't check what, well, she basically, she um, lied. She said that on her brochure that we all received, she said that she, had a, a Bachelor of Arts or BA in, um, what was it called? Um, applied Sciences mm -hmm. and then in brackets, it had alternate systems. So we thought that her degree was based on this sort of holistic approach to mm -hmm. life and things like that. But then after I actually got out, mm -hmm. uh, I realized that she actually had a Bachelor in Agriculture mm -hmm. and that's the only thing she had. So- Similar. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah. yeah, so um, it was ridiculous. And so she had no, not even a counseling certificate or anything. And she was teaching us to be counselors. And mm -hmm. so in about 2006, because of the her reputation um, plummeting and becoming known as a cult leader, she actually started this psychology degree and kept going. And then I don't think she, yeah, she became qualified in 2008, but then ex members who had left put in all of these complaints to um, the Australian health um, mm -hmm. regulator, et cetera, called APRA. And, um, but they, their investigation said, you know, they dismissed it, but apparently they said that she, there had been allegations of psychological abuse and um, physical assault. Um, but, you know, to be honest, yesterday I received bad news for the third time because I did put in another complaint to APRA in August last year, just putting everything factually, giving more evidence. And yesterday I received another letter with a decision from the Psychology Board of Australia saying that they had closed the case, dismissed it, because all of my facts and showing point blank her lies and different things, um, you know, they came back and said that she had people um, write in and um, showing her support for her. And it's just unbelievable. Like she even said in one of the points they had in the letter that 
she denied that I had been a student, um, a counselling client or her employee. And it just, it actually terrifies me that the, you know, highest psychological board in Australia can't see through the thick veil of, you know, a known psychopath and cult leader. It's completely frightening. And I mean, I know that you've experienced that over there. Yeah, so I, I, I've spoken with um, other therapists in Australia, uh, and I think that in Australia, your, your, your system is slightly different than it is in the U.S., positives and negatives, that there's one board for the whole country for almost all sort of medical disciplines, from doctor to psychologist. It's, like it's one board. And so yeah. they receive thousands and thousands of complaints because we're, we're looking at many disciplines. Whereas in the States, each of these boards are by each individual state mm -hmm. with their own individual set of rules. So mm -hmm. the board for a drug and alcohol counselor is di different than the board mm -hmm. for a psychotherapist, which is different for a psychiatrist, which is different for each discipline. So mm -hmm. it becomes a little bit more difficult in a place like Australia when you have mm -hmm. a small amount of people looking at abuses or claims of abuse across an entire spectrum of professions mm -hmm. than it would be in the United States. Mm -hmm. I and mean, that's the, maybe the downside of, of that. But clearly, at least in the States, any therapist is not allowed to go into business with a client. In fact, if, you were, if I was a psychotherapist therapist, and you were mm -hmm. my client, mm -hmm. and then we decided to have a romantic relationship, I can mm. never have that. That's right. Uh, if you decided to go into business <laughs> with you, I can never do that. Once the therapeutic relationship has been established, mm. it doesn't matter. Now, years ago, there would be like a five-year limit or a 10-year mm. limit, but it's been learned that there's always an unequal balance between the therapist mm. who know that you've revealed your inner worlds to, and they have not necessarily revealed their inner worlds to you. So the, the power mm. differential is there mm. and so you can't get into these businesses and so yeah. having her have you work had she mm. been a licensed therapist at least in my state she would exactly. have been uh in you know sort of she would have licensing issues uh, yeah. uh, but australia again is has different laws as to different states in the u.s that's right well and while we're while we're talking about this some of the questions that are coming in i think relate to this so somebody asked, I'm curious what abilities you think Natasha did have. Not psychic, but do you think she realized she was charismatic at some point and decided to exploit it? How much does she actually believe of what she says? I thought that was a great question. Um, any thoughts, Carly? I know it's probably hard to know for sure, but. <laughs> no, 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 they're good questions. And, uh, you know, we've definitely questioned ourselves. I mean, um, as I said, even that first program, you know, she looked into your eyes and, you know, I remember um, saying something like, um, you know, I've just always felt fear and that type of thing. And she said, haven't you always felt fear? And, you know, you just, and we were literally doing little processes and exercises to become more psychic and, you know, sitting in front of someone and just, you know, all these images would come and, you know, we had deep meditations where it felt like we were going into our past lives and things. So, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's true or not, um, she described how her grandmother read, um, you know, coffee or tea leaves and things like that. I mean, she might have had some of those abilities. She came from the Yugoslavia um, and what is now Serbia. And uh, look, I really don't know, but um, I believe that she did. Um, really believe what she was saying and that progressively the more she manipulated and asked of us and the more we actually did what she wanted capitulated just kept working all the time and doing whatever she wanted you know I personally was definitely um a slave and just um you know catered to every whim the more she manipulated that I believe that apparently those who came before me um prior to about 2000 and uh, sorry 1997 they said that they you know she did have good intentions and things like that and then something happened and she just started um you know becoming more paranoid and um flipping to the other sort of side and um becoming more sort of evil and um yeah, yeah it's an interesting thing I think but then on the other hand you know that 
some things were extremely calculated and um I also think that apparently she took a lot of drugs you know we hear about a lot of these cult leaders that take drugs and you know even Hitler did and you know I think the um what's that that cult in Australia the whitehead woman who was giving all of the psychedelic drugs oh, yeah, to yeah, the family yeah. uh, yes I know. You know and um I know that she took drugs she actually on our one of our courses she um made us all take um you know smoke marijuana joints that type of thing so I think you know she might have had these experiences like she told us of one night where uh she and her boyfriend they were 17 and you know they were parked in one area and then all of a sudden they were somewhere else and you know she believed that she was Jesus Christ and all this type yeah. of thing but I think maybe she was on drugs and she just woke up <laughs> somewhere else do you know what I mean yeah. Yeah. yeah this is an interesting thing that you bring up because I think that some group leaders start off believing their experiences but the feedback loops that are created are people then tell them, yes, what you told me is true. Yeah. And then they believe it. And then this feedback loop keeps on coming back to yes. And then there's those people who don't experience. And now I have to explain them away. So they're evil, they're contaminated, they're karmic, whatever it is. But yeah. the idea when someone claims to be a spiritual leader, we know that there are standards that exist in many fields. So in the United States, we have an office of standards and measurements. So there's something called an inch and you can go to the standards office and they show this is what an inch is and this is a yard and this is what a gallon is. So there's mm -hmm. a place that we can determine what standards uh, are for all kinds of things. We know what the temperature 28 degrees is because there's a standard for that. There's a way of measuring. But when it comes to spiritual areas, mm -hmm. frequently people don't think of standards. Mm. And I think that it's important to look at standards. So most great traditions, and when I say great, I'm not, I'm not putting a value on it. I'm just saying, oh, I'm thinking about it, that those who have lasted the test of time mm. have standards. Mm. So one of the standards that I frequently think about is in uh, the books of the Old Testament, from a Christian point of view, we would call it the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy, there's a standard of someone who claims to be a prophet. That's someone who can see, like a psychic. And the standard is, if they make one mistake, they should be stoned to death. Because the, and then I think about it, because the authors of the, 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 the text knew that if I said, hey, I'm a prophet, and we're in the desert, and we're thirsty, <laughs> and I said, <laughs> 20 miles that way, there is an oasis. And a hundred people follow me, and there is no oasis. A hundred people die. So mm. they they brought the standards way up and says, "Okay, you say you're this prophet, mm. you better not make a mistake, because then you're a fraud." And yeah. so the standards exist. And I think that in Eastern philosophy, depending on the, the the traditions that come out of India, there are also standards of maybe omniscience. You just can't make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And so people who claim these abilities that we, we, don't, we don't apply standards to, we can run into problems. Yeah. So I think that it's you know, valuable to look at old traditions and see how did they handle people who made these, these kinds of claims. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's something that I don't think we were, we were certainly not educated to do. You know, maybe if you're a philosophy right. major or you study something like that, you might start thinking about it. But most people aren't educated that there are ways of determining as somebody who they claim to be. Um, yeah. Because the, if they make a mistake, what they'll say is you're wrong. <laughs> you did something wrong. Uh, and that's, you know, doesn't sort of help us. <laughs> we mm. become victims then of their abuse. Yeah. And then if it's helpful. I want to, I have to interject because I want to be mindful of time. So we have, um, you know, a good like eight minutes left. And I know it's really early your time, Carly. So I want to get through as many of these questions as we can. Definitely. I call this the lightning round. So <laughs> some of these are comments, some of these are questions. So um, we'll see how many we can get through. Um, but I want to try to get through these remaining questions in the next like eight minutes, if that's possible. 
If it's yeah. not, I could always send you the remaining questions, Carly. Yeah. So yeah. are you ready? Are you up for it? Yes, I'm ready. Yes. Okay, let's do it. Um, somebody said, just a comment. Um, I ordered your book today. Thank you for writing it. After hearing your talk, I'm very interested to read it. Thank you so much. That's a very kind comment. Thank you. Somebody asked, is teaching people to be counselors a thing? My father, who was known as a prophet, did that with my son when he was a teenager in high school. It changed his entire future. He went from college bound to almost not graduating. Mm. His priorities completely changed to what his grandfather was guiding him to do per God. Dad would say, I have been given to know as a message from above. Um, I thought that was a very interesting question and comment. Yeah, I think that's a really important point that we all thought that um, our cult leader was, um, you know, Jesus Christ reincarnated a, a God as such. And I think that you have to be wary of these people that call themselves God because they're giving themselves a power that um, makes you hand over your power to them. And that's what happened to us. You know, I was a university graduate, but I was basically cleaning and, you know, mowing lawns and that type of thing. Um, you know, I, my whole life I had, once I escaped, I had to start again with my career because I felt like I was only worth working on the, on the front counter of McDonald's, that type of thing. Um, that's what they do to you. So it's very important that people look within themselves for their God or spirituality and not look to just one person, you know, read a diverse range of books, you know, listen to a lot of people, but never give your power over to someone else, regardless of whether they call themselves God or whoever they call themselves. This That's is, my opinion. This is an important point because I think we have to look at the traditions and the cultures that we come from as to, as to what those terms mean. So if you come from like a, a Western worldview, we have the idea of God as something separate from ourselves, that's God the Father, um, the all-powerful being. But in the East, um, the teachers are referred to as God. There's a, there's a saying that's very common in Sanskrit, Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Deva, Mahasra. The Guru is God, the creator, the maintainer. The, the Guru is God. And so we take this pedantic Western view and we impose it upon these people. But within their own culture, being, that doesn't mean the same sense as this all-powerful God. So we, our filters aren't there because uh, we perceive um, the concept in one way. But in other traditions, the concept is, 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 means something different and they get mixed together. A good teacher should be able to tell you, hey, when I say I mean God, I'm talking about it in this way, and in your culture, it means this. That would be self-disclosure. Yeah, mm. thank you. Somebody asked, hi, Carly. I was born and raised into a high-controlled Bible-based group. Could you comment on how to overcome the regret and maybe anger after leaving a group because of lost time and opportunities, because of time spent in an unhealthy group? How do you suggest moving on afterwards? Great question. Yeah, I think, you know, um, you, that is one of the, when I first got out, I was so angry and outraged and every night I would dream about the cult and the cult leader and you do really um, grieve that lost life, you know, I'd spent from the time I was 21 to 35, I missed out on my great 20s and half of my 30s and it's really important to, and you know, you were born into it. You know, my children, the three children were born into it too. So it's very hard for you to know who you are because you were given an identity and you were probably crushed from the time you were born until you left by this cult leader and everyone around you. So I think it's important to go within yourself find out what makes you happy, um, explore the world, explore reading, music, dancing, art, anything that um, excites you and, and do those things, you know, go for nature walks, be out in nature, do some, you know, really strenuous exercise for a while just to get that anger out because you will have a lot of anger. But I can assure you that once time goes on, um, your wounds will heal. You won't always forget, but I can tell you now that 
from, you know, for, you know, now I don't, when I think of my cult leader and what happened, my stomach isn't in knots. It's, it's fine. And it's taken me a long time to get to that place. But while you continue to have those knots in your stomach, the anger and the fear and everything else, just keep going. Unfortunately, you will have to live through that trauma however you can. How I said, you know, write it down, um, write a book if you would want to, you know, I think using your experience in a positive way is the best thing. And as I know, Donnie Witsit says, um, success is the best revenge. So, um, you know, you might not know what you want to do for work. I've just decided, um, you know, I've been an executive assistant for the last 10 years, but I've just decided to um, become a primary school teacher. So, um, you know, I'm going to apply to university at the end of this year and spend the next two years um, doing that and become a teacher because I've got another 20 years of, you know, my career to go and I want to spend it being happy and um, that type of thing. So I hope that helps, but I just want to assure you that there is a place you'll come to where you feel at peace and you want to move on with your life and have a happy life and you deserve yeah, that's it. That's a very well put. Uh, from someone who's been in this field for 38 years, what is amazing to me is that groups attract some of the best people because we're people who want to improve ourselves and improve the world. And to see the community of former members who have who are now gone on to who have accomplished such great things on the other side. Uh, and so people, so I know people who've been in for many, many years in groups and, you know, they're 65 and they're getting their, they got their PhD. Uh, but I, I know people who left when they were 20 and they're, you know, film, they make amazing films or winning awards. So there's a, there's a, there's the other side of this. This is just a piece of one's life that is part of us. Uh, and, and we need to integrate it, but there's, there's also, it's not that the defining thing in our lives. And uh, I think that yeah. going on to be a school teacher is an amazing thing. It is. It's amazing. Thank you, Thank you for sharing that. I think that's so cool. Um, I wish you all the best in your future studies. Um, unfortunately, you. we're out of time for today. Um, what I could do, Carly, is I could send you the remaining questions, and if you're able Definitely. and you have time, only if you have time, if you wanted to reach out to um, individuals, um, you can do that to just kind of wrap up the Q&A, um, but that's entirely up to you. So thank you again. Do you have a copy of your book near you that you can hold up one more time? Look, I've only I've only got my old one, um, which you know I my first go. Oh, the cover's I different. It yeah, it is. Yeah, I don't even. It's a bit embarrassing. <laughs> I, um, <laughs> it's not. Okay. Again. But I just wanted to say um, that my email address is on my website, so please feel free, anyone, if you do have questions or want to talk, I'm I'm totally open to that. And uh, thank you for listening and watching. And um, thank I wish you. you all love and all the best. Before, before you all go, uh, um, Ashton, maybe you could uh, tell people about the big event that's coming up soon, mm -hmm. the ICSA conference, and that for people who have written books, please let ICSA know so that potentially you could be uh, be interviewed about your uh, your your book. Yeah. So our next big event is the ICSA Annual Conference, and it is all online this year. It is July 1st through 3rd. And the best part about it being online is if you miss a talk, you will have access to almost all the recordings for up to 30 days. So that, that has never been done before at an ICSA conference to have all the talks ready to go and accessible for you to catch up on. So I am really excited. You can go to um, any of the ICSA social media channels to sign up via our link tree. Um, and, or you could also email me at mail at icsamail.com and I can get you guys set up with a ticket. So. What's amazing is I think there are 53 talks so far. There are 53 talks total. 53 talks uh, over those three days. So it's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of information. Yeah. And I, it should be an interesting conference. Yeah. Thank you both so much. Thank You're you, welcome. Carly. You, again, thank you look you. amazing for 2 a.m. Um, you, you look great. And thank you for your insights today. Fascinating interview. My pleasure. And um, thank you.
so helpful. Um, thank you, Pat, for joining us no um, on a Saturday. Um, My pleasure. Thanks, really appreciate it. I loved calling this the bonus interview because um, <laughs> I thought that it was a really fun sort of add on. So thank you all for joining us with this Meet the Author series. This concludes our first round of author interviews. We are working on um, finalizing the second round right now for people who've expressed interest. Again, feel free to email me or get in touch with ITSA if you are interested in being interviewed for this. So thank Great. you all. Everyone take yes, care. Man. Have a wonderful weekend. And we'll see you guys soon. Thank, thank you. you. See you later, Carly. Bye-bye. <laughs>